to uh, welcome you to this program and uh, I'm coming to meet you once again and it's uh, quite interesting that we're able to meet on these terms and uh, uh, although I can't see you I still feel that we do have a relationship and so I'm happy to be talking and Today I'm going to be dealing with something which I hope will lead me into a series because what I'm looking at is for a change. I'm looking at what really the emphasis is in, in the church, not on the church, but in the church. And I'm starting from the first chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, which I think is appropriate at this time, particularly because here in England, as I record this, we are looking at coming out of lockdown and everybody, government down, is assessing what our future is. And so really, as I start with this uh, beginning of the chapter where it's, uh, Luke writing, obviously, the Acts of the Apostles, that's what we accept. He's writing and saying he has already written a previous letter in which he details all that Jesus did until the day in which he was taken up um, at the, after, the, after the resurrection. And so, as we go into this, what I'm very concerned about and very interested in is the fact that Luke is saying that um, Jesus, of course, was able to teach after the resurrection. You know, we have to, that's what I'm looking at, actually. The fact that Jesus uh, did clearly teach after the resurrection, right up until the moment, immediately before Pentecost, he was taken up into heaven. So in verse, uh, 20, uh, verse 3, he's saying, the apostles that he had chosen, to whom he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them for 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now, this is very important because sometimes we lose sight of the fact that, yes, we believe in the resurrection, although, of course, or some who, who don't believe it, although one book written many years ago did bring a lot of conviction to me, uh, I'm talking about my teenage years. I was given the book one Christmas, uh, and it was called Who Moved the Stone? And it was written by an atheist who set out to disprove the resurrection because he sensed, and I'm talking about this because he sensed that the whole evidence of Christianity, Christian faith, and what we preach is dependent on resurrection. In other words, if there's no resurrection, if Christ did not rise from the dead, the whole thing is a lie. And it's very interesting because this man set out to um, actually prove that the resurrection shouldn't, couldn't happen. And in the most amazing book, as he researched, um, I can't go into details now, but as he researched, the more he researched, the more he found such infallible proof that he completely changed. And as he's writing the book, he's changing until suddenly became, he becomes an ardent believer because of the infallible proof that he found. And that's why I find it interesting in verse 3 that Jesus showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. And it was for a period of 40 days that he is appearing to the disciples and speaking to them. And in a way, I mean, even uh, as I was researching this today, I, I was looking back into to Luke because actually Luke so at the end of his um, gospel, he, he's leading up to 
uh, this very moment that he's talking about now, which is uh, the introduction of Pentecost. And he he's saying that on the very day of the resurrection, on that same Sunday, that first day of the week, um, that that was the day that the disciples were walking to Emmaus and Jesus appeared to him. You know the story, such a familiar story, how on the journey they said to him, oh, we're sad and very unha unhappy because of what happened. He says, what are you talking about? And then he said, they say, because of the, the fact that Jesus died and so on. And from that moment on, Jesus takes scripture after scripture to prove to them that he, his death and resurrection were already clearly foretold. And yet they still didn't understand. Now, I find this very interesting because despite the fact that he was discussing every scripture, and of course he knew them better than anybody, they still didn't understand. All they said to him, well, stranger, uh, you spent so much time talking to us. Here, we've come to the hotel we're staying at tonight, the inn. Uh, why don't you spend the night here? Or certainly have supper with us. And it was while they were sat at supper, as he took the bed and broke it, only when they saw the marks of the nails in his hand did they realize who he was. And... I'm so excited to read that they didn't stay there in Emmaus. They, they, they went back immediately the same day and met the other 11 disciples who were saying, look, Jesus is risen. And then, of course, they're saying, yes, he met with us and he walked with us. But you see, this is the reality of Jesus that his ministry did not actually end at his death or even his resurrection. It continued. And uh, it says here in verse 4, and being assembled together with them, um, he met them so many times until he commanded them that these are the disciples, that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise from the Father, which he said, you have heard of me. For in verse 5, truly John baptized with water. Jesus didn't. John did. But you will be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So Jesus, even right up to this time, is still speaking prophetically of what is about to happen. So these 40 days were very significant in the relationship between Jesus and the disciples. And it's not only those he was seen by many, it says. He was seen by countless numbers uh, at this time. And of course, you even know that um, he met them on the shore and cooked for them and all sorts of things so that there was very much reaction between the risen Christ and the Christ that they had known before. And then in verse 6 of this chapter, when they were therefore come together, they asked him saying, you're talking to us about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You're saying that we have to stay in Jerusalem. We have to not begin our actual ministry. And I want you to realize they were told not to begin the ministry until the Holy Spirit came. And they were so convinced and he was speaking so dim, uh, so. <laughs> demonstrably talking about what was going to happen after the Holy Spirit came, he not only convinced them of this power and evidence of the Holy Spirit, but something else, because they then turned to him and said, when this happens, Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? In other words, get rid of the Roman masters and give us back control of our own nation. And remember they, that, that Israel had not known freedom for a long time. They'd been under the Greeks and under the Romans. And that was to continue for some time after the death and resurrection. So 
this was a very serious political issue because two things and I'm only realizing this as I speak to you. You see, so strong had been the evidence in the teaching of Jesus on the coming kingdom. You know, I, the more I, 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 I become an evangelist, the more evangelism, and particularly in this time when I've been at home and researching and studying and praying, I become more and more conscious that the biggest message that Jesus taught when he was on earth before his death was Bible prophecy, because what do you think he was talking about to the elders when he was 13, the elders in the temple? And so often he is referring to the fulfillment of Scripture. So not only was he the fulfillment of Scripture, but he is relating what is to come and still speaking. And so strongly that when the disciples hear about this coming of the Holy Spirit, they're so taken up with the combination that they say to him, will you, when the Holy Spirit comes, restore the kingdom to Israel? In other words, are you going to be the coming king, and is this what we're looking for? Now, I find this quite amazing in the context of our lives today, that the, the preaching of the kingdom was so strong on this early church after the crucifixion that they believe that Jesus is going to return within a very, very short period. But of course, as we know, 2,000 years have passed. But then, and again, you mustn't lose the context of this, because in the very next verse, verse 7, when they're saying, when the Holy Spirit is come, with the Holy Spirit will you restore the kingdom? And then he says, but it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. And you know, this is a very strong warning, because even today and in the past, uh, my father, for example, was what's known with regard to prophecy. My father wrote books on and, and teached and, and, and preached on, uh, on, on, on Bible prophecy and the second coming. But he was a great believer in what's called a historicist version, where they put dates. But even he had to admit the error because he would show me books written in the 1800s which fixed dates uh, in the 1800s and then the 1900s. The only one thing he did say was, and he showed me one book which would fix the date of the return of Christ as 1917. And in talking to me in the 1950s, what he said to me is, look, the one thing that did happen was that was when Jerusalem was restored when the, 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 the Muslims were thrown out and uh, under Allenby, who took Jerusalem, that was a miracle. And strangely enough, that was one of the dates that they had determined as being for the return of Christ, but it wasn't. So I could never accept date fixing. And it disturbs me when even today I see so-called prophets and people that write books who try to work out from the prophecies in Daniel, and usually it's from the prophecies in Daniel, they try and work out an exact, precise date. Oh, yeah, that's, that, that's happening all the time. I mean, there are people saying that he has to return at the Feast of Tabernacles and that it will be in such and such a year because they try to calculate the weeks and the days from Daniel. But Jesus himself rebuked that. He said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. Now, there's no scriptural evidence to confirm this, but in my own mind, I doubt if at that point Jesus himself knew. But instead of just leaving it at that, and you've got to get this context, they would come together, they asked him, you've told us about the Holy Spirit, 
when the Holy Spirit is come, will you restore the kingdom? He rebukes them and says, don't bother about times or seasons. He says, verse 8, but do the job now because you're going to receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you're going to be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and the right to the end of the earth. So in other words, he's rebuking them and saying, look, the Holy Spirit is coming to give you the power to do the job. Come on, boys, get on with it. You've got a job to do. You've got to get on with this job. And you know, this is, this is how it came to me that, yes, I, I write books and I speak sometimes on prophecy without fixing dates. All I'm saying is that we are so much nearer the return of Christ and that many of the prophetic signs are being fulfilled. And yet, that does not slow me down, but only renews that spirit within me of that I'm going to receive power to become a witness to the end of the world. And the reason that I'm speaking to you like this now is quite strong. Because when I was preparing this message, um, it's in awareness that the time when I'm speaking this, I don't know when you actually will hear me, but when I'm speaking it, we are, as a nation, not as a church, unfortunately, but as a nation, all the news is coming out from our Prime Minister, and it's in the newspapers today. They are planning how we're coming out of lockdown and recession. And they're very buoyant and quite enthusiastic. And interestingly enough, uh, they're now saying that because of Brexit, there's every reason to believe with our rapid vaccination will come out of the lockdown before Europe and that Britain can now take a leading place in the world, which I believe she should have always done. I, I've never downed Britain and I, I, I do believe that God wants to, I believe there's, well, I'll tell you how I feel. I don't believe there's any nation in the world except Israel whom God has for these 2,000 years used as strongly, as specifically, and as powerfully as Britain. I think Britain has a place in prophecy, and I believe that, that in Britain we've done more to spread the gospel to the world than even America. And it goes back because so many people say that when the Romans finally left uh, Britain in the 500s, some are saying, oh, Britain at that time, and, you know, uh, a load of savages and so on. No, what they're discovering was that as the Roman occupation came to an end because of the collapse of Rome, that the, the Britain was already strong and a secular historian, I heard him on television when he was discussing this, his own very words were that at that time, Britain was sending missionaries into Europe and Britain evangelized Europe. Come on. <laughs> I'm not the first, but do you understand? I'm actually following a long tradition of evangelizing Europe. So you see, the point that I'm making here is that we in the church must re-evaluate now how we're going to come out of the lockdown, how we're going to face the challenge just as we had to face a challenge at the end of the Second World War, how we had to face a challenge when communism was finally defeated. I believe that this church, Christian, and I'm talking to the church now, church, this is the biggest challenge in your lifetime to see the Word of God, seek the Word of God, and not sit down and bemoan the problems, but take advantage of every disadvantage. And let's get up, and I'll tell you now, and I've never said this to my staff before, and they're listening to me, and they'll make a note to remind me. 
I'm actually going to come out of this lockdown with a massive prayer for another baptism of the Holy Spirit so that like that, those early believers, as they're realizing that Jesus is alive and that every prophecy is going to be fulfilled, and Jesus says, wait in Jerusalem, and while you're waiting, then you will receive power. Let's come out of this time of lockdown and recession and waiting, seeking for another outpouring of the Holy Spirit, a revelation of power and of glory. Come on, why not? That's what happened to these disciples. And in verse 9, when he'd spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, Two men stood by them in white apparel, and they said in verse 11, You men of Galilee, why do you stand there just looking into heaven? This same Jesus whom you've seen go up will come back in the same way that he goes. And they were on the Mount of Olives, as you know, it says that in the next verse. So the challenge from the angels is this, stop just looking, stop just gazing into heaven, get back down to earth, go back in that room, wait for the power. And I want to challenge you, Christian and church, I want to challenge you this, that we've got to stop just looking uh, some people call it navel look gazing. You know what I mean? Stop looking at ourselves and we've got to look at the need of the world. And that's what we're doing in this ministry. This is what we're doing in Eurovision. This is what I'm doing personally. Is I'm getting all fired up and excited, believing that God will give me a greater and more powerful anointing of the Holy Spirit after we come out of this lockdown or while we're coming out of the lockdown, so that when we come out, I won't come out as an old, weak, retired man. I'm going to come out as not retired, but re-fired with a new fire and a new power and a new vision. And I'm going to have to stop looking simply into heaven. And I've got to see that this Holy Spirit is given to me. Why? As Jesus said, he said, you will become witnesses to me, both Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the end of the earth. And uh, <laughs> that was such a challenge to me that when I was going to the far side of Siberia, and by the way, Siberia isn't the far, the, the end of Russia isn't Siberia, the end of Russia is the far east. When you get to Magadan and Vladivostok and to Sakhalin, so on, you look on your map. In fact, from the far part of, uh, of, of Russia, it's actually possible on the ice to walk to Alaska. And I wonder, actually, because uh, it's being suggested that Columbus wasn't the first to discover America, that uh, possibly Vikings or others had already gone there before him on that northern route. And so uh, I laughingly say to people, when you actually get to the far side of the far east of Russia, if you keep walking, you fall off the edge because you come to the other side of the globe. You're coming back to America. But literally what's going to happen is we're going to reach to the far side of the world. And this has to be done. The message hasn't changed. And if Jesus were to come back again for a few minutes to challenge us, he would simply say, or oh, if you meet the angels, the angels say, stop looking up and stop just bothering with your internal things. It's time that you go out there and you preach this gospel and you change the world. And um, yes, so the disciples went back into Jerusalem. They came into an upper room where they were staying. They, they, they met the other 11 and they continued there in prayer. And the number grew over the next days. Uh, they were joined by 
uh, the, the women, including the mother of Jesus in verse 14, also it included his brothers, and it appears when they were casting lots as to who should replace Judas, that they chose two men who had also been with them, as they say, from the very day that John was baptized in Jordan until that moment when he was crucified. So there was a gathering. We know that ultimately there were 120 of them who were the ones who all 120 men and women filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's where we come to the day of Pentecost. And I'm raising a challenge and you need to listen to me next time because I'm going to continue this challenge. Father, just open people's eyes and Lord, let us see another Pentecost to transform a church coming out of lockdown. In Jesus' name, amen.